my bit. Now, what I want to do, it's, it's now um, a great pleasure of mine to, to welcome um, a person who was born in North Shields, um, lived in New Hartley and Seaton Delaville, uh, three places which I know. Um, and you can call her a true Geordie because she's, she's north, north of the time. You know, it really is annoying when people come from Gateshead and say they're Geordies. They're not really Geordies. You've got to be north of the time to be a Geordie. And Laura is north of the town. She's a proper Geordie. Um, she went to Manchester Metropolitan University, which can't be bad. Um, and she got an MSc at uh, Northumbria University in 2012. Uh, became an MP for the Northwest um, Durham constituency in 2017. And since 2019, unfortunately, when she lost her seat, uh, she's become uh, one of the CLP's um, reps on the NEC. Um, as well as the National Secretary of the People's Assembly Against Austerity. So she hadn't sat down and thought, well, I've done my, done my bit in Parliament. She's carried on um, doing and saying what she, what she believes in. Um, in fact, I heard Laura in 2019 at the Durham Miners Gala, which I recommend everyone to go to. It is fantastic. And she stood there, she talked about her dad, um, talked about her, her life, um, where she was, um, her enthusiasm, um, her ideas, her beliefs, enthused everyone who was there. I, I thought it was a fantastic speech. And I'm actually delighted she's accepted the invitation to come along to For the Many Mondays and talk to us this evening. And so I give you Laura Pidcock. Welcome, Laura. Oh, what an introduction, David. Um... And thanks very much to Anne for making the connect to David as well. Um, a good, a good Unite sister there. Um, and this is a great idea. So I'm just really, really pleased to be here. And that kind of whistle stop tour of my life, if you like, has brought me to this point. Um, I am a serving member of the National Executive Committee of the Labour Party. Um, so thanks for electing me if you did vote for me and electing me to the longest meetings in the history of the world on the National Executive Committee. Um, it, it is a, a wonderful idea to get together and think about ideas and not just think about minutes and you know the last minutes of the meeting and to be together in kind of comradeship so I'm, I'm pleased to be able to be here with you tonight to share some of my ideas and um, kind of I humbly say that because I know many of you are activists um, and to, to be in your your company. I did ask David you know what what did you want me to talk about and what did you want this to be about and he really um, just asked that it was a general overview of my thoughts right now where we're at and I've always kind of cared about life outside of the Labour Party as well as life inside the Labour Party. I'm a trade unionist, but I'm also very active in the extra parliamentary movement, as I know many of you are. So anti-racist work and anti-austerity work. And as David said, I'm the National Secretary of the People's Assembly. And I do think um, some of the political defeats that we have endured not just in the last five years, but in the um, in it, the many decades uh, that have been, we really need to build the extra parliamentary movement, and we need to kind of build left strength in the Labour Party. But I'll talk about that as as we go on. I think that the the defeat of the Labour Party at the twenty nineteen general election has had significant ramifications, which are only really being borne out now. Um, and for me, there are kind of three main strands that we're experiencing, and I'll talk about those. Uh, I just wanted to say something about that night in 2019 when we're in a, a, a sports hall in County Durham, and you can see the votes piling up for the Tories and you kind of, I felt like I was outside of my body. We kind of knew it was very difficult on the doorsteps. We knew that Brexit was so dominant and people were so kind of dissatisfied with the position that the Labour Party had in Northwest Durham, you know, not necessarily speaking for anywhere else, but there was certainly a trend and that we knew there was a feeling that it would be either very, very tight or that it would be lost and it and it was lost and really as a left as a Labour Party as a society as anyone who cares about the advancement of working class communities 
we have to look that defeat squarely in, in the face. And I certainly have spent a lot of time reflecting on the thousands of conversations on the people that I love and I represented and the community that I live in and had the privilege of representing for those two and a half years. I just want to talk about the three main strands now of where I kind of think we're at and uh, it isn't all doom and gloom <laughs> for, for us on the left and, and for activists, although the challenges are significant. I think firstly, there is a kind of reorientation of the left, I think, that was inevitable after the defeat and the consequence of, of the defeat um, of, the, of the Corbyn project or, you know, whatever you want to kind of call that era. Secondly, is the overwhelming dominance of the right wing. So the Conservatives have obviously a huge majority but also we just went through council elections and mayoral elections where many of the the seats were very very dominant to a kind of a, a right-wing candidate a right-wing vote and I think third is about the crisis that we're living through so multiple crises in fact a health crisis and environmental crisis both having their roots in the crisis of capitalism so I think, first of all, living through those three elements is exhausting. I think we should acknowledge that, that um, looking at that set of problems that we face, knowing the scale of the challenge and trying to work out how we defeat the right to take us to a path where there are solutions and where those solutions are possible can feel like an overwhelming task. But as overwhelming as it may feel, we have to rise to, to that challenge. And for want of a better term, you know, call it whatever you like, but you know what I mean where I, when I, I talk about the Corbyn project, that political project, which was really about trying to break from the acceptance of a neoliberal consensus which has firmly taken root in society in the parliamentary labor party and to replace it with a socialist one and of course at that time when jeremy was standing that manifested itself and was borne out to be an anti-austerity politics an anti-war politics and an anti-imperialist politics that jeremy kind of came to symbolize it was about a process, too, of democratisation of the Labour Party, and it was about doing things differently. So to start to make a, a, a dedication, a commitment to community organising rather than just pure electoralism. And I think the opportunity to accomplish what we set out to do was under constant attack. <laughs> I don't think any of you... Um, we'll be shocked at that you live through it, not just by external factors like the bombardment of the mainstream media or the huge constitutional entanglement, which was Brexit, but of course many of our own MPs did things to harm our opportunities. Every step we took, there were unbelievable hurdles, divisive tactics and deliberate De deliberate traps. I served in Jeremy Corbyn's shadow cabinet as shadow minister for employment rights or for the Ministry of Labour, if you want the kind of original name. And that was about fundamentally a transference of power. If you think about sectoral collective bargaining, you know, that, that kind of right for workers who are organised to be meeting as equals um, those people who own the business um, by sector and build that sectoral power, that was about a transference of power and that was about a transference of wealth. And of course that's going to be met with resistance. The abolition or the getting rid of the Trade Union 2016 Act um, was a commitment that we made to bring forth legislation for new powers and freedoms for trade unions to access the workplace, to organise, to represent, to build that sectoral power. Of course that was going to be met with resistance and so much more. That was just in my own department. I think that uh, that defeat hurt our collective confidence or has the potential to hurt our collective confidence. We shouldn't let it. Um, it can give us the tendency to kind of look down rather than outward. And I think that the leadership of the party have also chosen wrongly to target many of those hard work and left wing activists in the party, making it an unwelcome space some of the time, damaging that confidence even more and I just want to know I don't know whether any of you saw on Facebook and I know you'll have had your own own rallies and um, where where you are but four years ago 
almost precisely to the day. We had a, a, a rally in Gateshead, David, which is south um, of the river. Um, but I'm now in Durham, so I've got no right to talk. Uh, the, there were 10,000 people that came out on the banks of the River Tyne. 10,000 people, and I spoke to that rally, of course, people came to see Jeremy Corbyn, nobody had heard of me, but I spoke to that rally, and I will never, ever forget the hope, the enthusiasm, the energy, it didn't stop raining, but it was electrifying. It was a completely electrifying experience. And I want us just to think about, well, what happened to that hope? Where has it gone? What happened to that energy? How can it be rekindled? And how can it be used for um, and, you know, as a as to kind of keep that energy in to activity, whether inside or outside the Labour Party, that um, that improves all of our lives. So then I want to kind of turn to the dominance of the conservative right. I think we all know that they are very confident right now, um, utterly rampant, if you like, shamelessly ruthless in their implementation of their politics. Think about that evidence that Dominic Cummins gave to the select committee. Uh, we knew at the time that the government were failing us, but this was a person that was in the room for those key decisions. And he was openly saying that he didn't think the prime minister was fit and proper to take us through the crisis, that Hancock should have been sacked and that crucially tens of thousands of people died needlessly. And yet there's not been one resignation. The ripples of outrage and anger barely made like a big kind of impactful ripple outside of the blue tick Twitter. Try and say, try and say that as a bit, a bit of a tongue, tongue twister. And then look at what they're actually doing now. So the police crime sentencing and courts bill. I mean, a really dangerous piece of legislation that looks to restrict our right to assemble freely in what way we choose to protest to make our Mark the continued mishandling of the crisis, the continuation of, of austerity, the entrenchment of poverty, the dismantling of local government, the creation of free port systems, the hardening of the hostile environment against immigrants, and so much more that's only able to happen because the Conservatives have a dominant narrative, a dominance I think that they have enjoyed since Thatcher, to be quite honest. And I'm not saying all of this just to like say that it's hopeless, that we're doomed, that there's no way we can transform the current political system. None of you would be here at night. None of you would be on this call if, if you believed that. And I will come on a more hopeful reflections and the ways I think we can build out of this. But the last element, I think, of our current position is, of course, the crisis, the health crisis, and the huge environmental crisis that we face. I feel like there is crisis everywhere, and that's because there is. So, you know, capitalism destroys, it has no regard, in my view, for human life, no regard for the fragility of the ecosystem, the cleanliness of the seas, the purity of the air, or the need to protect life on Earth. And the coronavirus has not kind of created the inequalities, we know that, that exist, but it's entrenched them, hasn't it? It's shone a light on the systems and of inadequacies, the unequal vaccine distribution, I mean, globally there, the importance of workplace rights, the importance of a robust social security system, the absolute necessity to care and provide for people when they're not well so that they can recover, and the absolute dependency, in my view, that we have on one another that we are not individuals, that we are a society that is dependent. This, our, our recovery from coronavirus has always felt like it needs to be a collective recovery. And that, you know, if we, if we just look at what is facing us, there are hundreds of thousands of people who are in rent arrears, millions of people in poverty, we're living in a global pandemic, and we have a mere decade to take radical action to save the planet. What we do know is that this system doesn't work, and it simply can't go on like this. And that's where I think we should take our confidence from, knowing that the political ideology that many of us will subscribe to, and I know, you know, we'll have our disagreements and we'll be on some kind of spectrum but it has many of the solutions that we collectively need so what do we actually do I think 
uh, crucially, we must use our energy in the best way possible. And I think that means a reorientation of our activity to do a couple of things. And I would absolutely love to hear uh, any of the things that you have in mind for where we go from here. But first, I think we need to be there for our communities to build mechanisms to help us get out of this crisis. So a continuation and an expansion of the mutual support groups, of food banks, of collectives to campaign and be active in our communities for things that our communities need. I think secondly, we need to urgently, and I think we've needed this for a long time, we need to urgently replace the political spaces that have been lost. So those spaces that have been stripped from our communities that came with the attack on organized labor. So the online space is really important and I'm certain, you know, it's an important tool and I'm certainly not advocating that we retreat from that space, but I think our organizing capacity is better spent elsewhere. I think it's better spent in the physical space, having conversations when we can, and you know, when we are truly able to um, mix, having conversations in, with people in real life. So I suggest that we embark and build on the biggest network of left spaces ever, which are practically useful and unashamedly political, build to allow people to meet and experience, have challenging conversations, to experience joy and laughter, as well as support and solidarity. I think the left could really unite under this cause. And if we are able to challenge, to change the dominance of the right wing and shift the framework to a narrative that is able to expose the system for what it really is, but and crucially to build confidence that there is another way that we can live, a life which is free from fear, which is warm and beautiful, not just you know about the basics. I, 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 do, I do honestly believe that, that it's possible. Otherwise, what else will we do? <laughs> Just keep accepting Tory majorities that, you know, accepting the kind of narrow, kind of unambitious political framework that we're given for our communities, accept poverty pay to be endemic. I don't think any of us are prepared to accept that. And I think that means building outwards building physically in our communities and putting back those spaces where we can meet and have those difficult conversations to try and change attitudes in, you know, a safe, a, a safe environment, but that those spaces are practically useful too, whilst also building online and being confident and building left power within the Labour Party, taking to the streets with the People's Assembly uh, in confident expressions against the government, uh, street stalls, all of the things that we do, but also that physical network too. And I think it also means being kind of very loud and proud and confident about our politics as the politics that has lots of the solutions to the problems that we face. Those are just some of my initial reflections, David, on uh, where I think we're at now. What are some of the things I think we could do next? And I'd really like to hear what everybody else has to say. Thank you very much, David. You muted, Dave. I am muted, aren't I? It's terrible. I think that's the most common word in the English language uh, since um, COVID is you're muted. You're muted. I was saying, Laura, I told everyone that you were enthusiastic. You are enthusiastic. Your ideas are great. Um, long may you continue to have the courage to say what you believe. Um, thank you very much for that. 